So good evening. Uh, my name is Frank Sisson. Uh, I'm from the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta. Uh, and uh, uh, I have the pleasure of greeting you at this, the 19th annual Toronto famine, uh, Ukrainian famine lecture. This happens to be a year in which we have a, a great number of anniversaries of various kinds. Uh, for the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, this is its 40th anniversary. And uh, I would ask you to pick up our invitation to you all to come on Sunday to Old Mill, where we will be celebrating that anniversary, uh, as well as the appearance of a new volume of Mikhailo Ruszewski's History of Ukraine Rus. So please try and make that and join us there. This is also the 150th anniversary of Ruszewski's birth. Uh, the most important Ukrainian historian, uh, the head of the first independent Ukrainian state in modern times. And so these are all celebrations that we look forward to. Now today for most of us uh, is the 98th anniversary of the armistice, armistice of World War I. Uh, I. I was at the a commemorative service today at the Soldiers Tower at the University of Toronto. And I was really quite stunned at how many young people came out uh, uh, for an event that in many ways happened so long ago, almost ancient history for them. It's an interesting part, I think, of Canadian identity. I, I don't know if you saw the statistics that said that Canada has the highest percentage of people who go to the war commemorations, uh, higher than Britain, uh, higher than most parts of Europe, and that I found interesting. So the 11th, 11th is a very meaningful event. But for this event, this is the 83rd anniversary of the Great Famine or Holodomor in Ukraine. Uh, and so in a way in which we commemorate the dead of the First World War, we are also commemorating the millions who died uh, in the Great Famine in Ukraine. Now, as I said, this is the 19th Toronto Lecture, and it is our assumption, and I think it is true, that we are the oldest continuing lecture about the Ukrainian famine. And that might seem strange to those of you who come here uh, and are not too conversant with the history of the Ukrainian famine. Uh, but in Ukraine, one could not even mention it had happened until the late 1980s, that for 50 years, the homeland could not mention a tragedy that took four, five, we're unsure how many million until people could study it, uh, uh, deaths, particularly in the first months of 1933. Um, this famine lecture began because of a request of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress of Toronto, which has always been our co-sponsor. Uh, that was followed up by the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies office agreeing to organize this event, and that it was joined by at that point, what was Ceres, uh, or Kreis in those days, the Center for Russian East European Studies, and later the Yatsik program was formed at that center, and they have continued on that tradition. In years after that, we received financial support from the Canadian Foundation of Ukrainian Studies, and we are very grateful for them for that support. But in many ways, uh, this famine lecture has taken on special significance since 2013. 2013 was the year in which the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium was founded by a generous donation from the Temerte Family Foundation. It meant that not only would Toronto be the place where the famine lecture was done on a yearly basis, but I think as you can see from seeing our schedule that uh, there were numerous conferences, uh, scholars come to Toronto, research goes on, uh, and activities in introducing the Holodomor into curriculum uh, are well developed. And all of this has given, I think, this particular lecture a special significance. Uh, we have had, in over a number of years, stellar lecturers. Uh, I think many of you were at Ann Applebaum's lecture two years ago, Tim Snyder's a year ago, and this year we have Serhi Plokhi. Uh, this gives us particular pleasure because Serhi Ploki began his career in North America at our institute and now continues it as the Ruszewski professor in Harvard. Uh, I would ask, like to ask the director of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, Volodymyr Krauchenko, to introduce our speaker for the evening. Volodymyr.
Ladies and gentlemen, Panita Panove, uh, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Serhii Pluhi as today's keynote speaker. Uh, Thirty and something years ago when I met with Serhii in Dnipropetrovsk, now Dnipro, we were taking part in a student conference devoted to 325th anniversary of Pereyaslav Agreement, Pereyaslavska Rada. If somebody told me that time that I would introduce Serhii Plohi, director of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, Mikhailo Hrushevsky professor, who is going to talk about Ukrainian Holodomor to the audience in Toronto, I would confess that my imagination was too narrow to accept such a fantasy. Everybody in the Soviet Union was well aware that the best way to make an academic career in history was to take topic in the field of the history of KPSS, CPSU. The huge job market in this, in this area of Soviet propaganda would guarantee you stability and certain respect. Topics from the deeper history beyond the 20th century could guarantee nothing. They were considered neactualni. It means non-topical, irrelevant, far beyond the mainstream. However, Serhii Plohi was already determined to study Polish early modern historiography of Ukrainian Cossacks at that time. In spite of this uh, neactualna, non-topical topic, his career became a success from the beginning. He graduated from Dnipropetrovsk University with magna cum laude in history and historical studies, and in 1982 defended his candidate of historical sciences dissertations, dissertation at People's Friendship University in Moscow. In 1990, he received his doctorate from Taras Shevchenko University in, Ki in Kyiv and was promoted to the rank of full professor at his alma mater at the University of Dnipropetrovsk. It was a very impressive start for a young scholar. However, Sergei made it even more impressive when he joined the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta. From what I know, it was Frank Sisson who played a major role in this transfer, which occurred even before the dissolution of the Soviet Union. While in Edmonton, Sirhi founded the research program on religion and culture and actively participated in the publication of the English language translation of Mikhail Hrushevsky's History of Ukraine Rus under Frank's leadership. Three scholars, Frank Sisson, Zenon Kohut, and Serhii Plohi, together created perhaps the first historiographical school in Canada, specialized in the early modern Ukrainian history. I would say that Serhii Plohi was retrained as a Western his scholar at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies during 90s and uh, 2004. He didn't stop, however. In 2007, so he was named the Mikhail Hrushevsky Professor of Ukrainian History at Harvard. Since 2013, he has served as the director of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, where he leads a group of scholars working on MAPA, the Digital Atlas of Ukraine, and the problems of Holodomor. Since that, a lot of things happened. I'm not going to follow his many accomplishments one by one. There are too many of them. Let me just name several topics of his uh, research academic activity, each of them culminated with the respective monograph. The Man with the Poison Gun, a Cold War spy story, issued this year about Bandera's assassination. The Gates of Europe, a history of Ukraine. The Last Empire, the final days of the Soviet Union. The Cossack myth, history and nationhood in the age of empires. Yalta, the price of peace. Um, Ukraine and Russia, representations of the past, the origins of the Slavic nations, premodern identities in Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, unmaking imperial Russia, Mikhail Hrushevsky and the writing of Ukrainian history uh, issued two years ago. Plohi's books have been translated into a number of languages, including Belarusian, Chinese, Estonian, Polish, Portuguese, Romanian, Spanish, Russian, and Ukrainian. They won numerous awards and prizes. The Last Empire, the final days of the Soviet Union, won the 2015 Lion Gelber Prize for the world's best non-fiction book in English on global issues. 
Uh, Pushkin House, uh, a Russian book prize of 2015. Um, Historia Nova Prize for the best book on Russian intellectual history. The American Association for Ukrainian Studies book prize. The Ukrainian National Women's League of America book prize. The Book of the Year Prize, Biographies and Memories in Ukraine. Uh, in 2015, Serhii Plohi received the Antonovich Prize. Forty years ago, when CIUS was established at the University of Alberta, it was not possible to develop Ukrainian studies in Canada without American scholars. The whole generation of professional Ukrainianists trained at the elite American universities came to Canada and occupied professorial positions at Canadian universities. Now it would be fair to say that Canada is able to repay, to start re-exporting specialists in Ukrainian studies back to America. Having said that, I wonder if we are going to expect another flood, another generation of specialists in Ukrainian studies to Canada after the most controversial presidential campaign in the United States I ever saw. Said he, just in case, please be aware that you are welcome back to Canada anytime. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Serhii Plokhi. Well, uh, thanks a lot. I'm, I have a ticket back to Boston for Sunday. I, 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 I will think about this offer, but thanks, thanks a lot for this, uh, for this very generous. Uh, presentation. It's really my pleasure to be here. It's a homecoming in, in, in many ways. Uh, coming back to Canada, coming back to the event that was organized by the uh, uh, Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. And I am really very grateful to the Institute. I am very grateful to RAC. I am very grateful to uh, Temerty Foundation for um, uh, sponsoring this event. And it's, it's, again, my pleasure to see many, many faces of my friends and, and colleagues from, from days in Edmonton and from days in Toronto. So uh, thanks, thanks for coming today. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today is, is um, uh, famine, uh, Holodomor, uh, the history of famine and new research on Holodomor. I am a little bit nervous because uh, the, the, this lecture series here is already for a while. You had some of the best experts working on the topic. And Applebaum, who was mentioned here, she is finishing the book now. Before the end of the year, the book will be done <coughs> on the history of the famine, which will be really very, very interesting and groundbreaking book. Uh, I will talk on the research that have been done on the history of Holodomor at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute for the last five plus years. But I want to start uh, this lecture in the place where normally lectures on Holodomor probably don't start. And this is in uh, New York, in Manhattan. And imagine the depth of the Great Depression year 1931, with um, stock market losing 90% of, of its value, with um, industrial production going down 45% at least, with losses, unemployment beyond belief, and uh, there are no place in Manhattan that would higher qualified people, engineers, and so on and so forth for <clears throat> longer than maybe a few weeks. There is only one place that is hiring and is paying good money and is hiring for a long period of time. And uh, that place is called the Soviet Trade Mission. They announce 5,000 well-paid jobs for professionals, long-term jobs, and there are 100,000 applications for those jobs. Uh, and uh, the jobs are in the Soviet Union, including in Soviet Ukraine. Uh, the Soviet government is paying with hard currency at that time. And uh, it's paying quite well. The chief um, consultant, engineering consultant, for the construction of 
uh, Dnipro has the Dnipro electric power station and dam. Uh, his name was uh, Hugh Lincoln Cooper. He was a colonel in the US Army, but was an engineer. He cut his teeth in uh, terms of building um, power stations, among other places, at the Toronto Power um, uh, Station at Niagara Falls. So he is well experienced. He also is not a friend of the Soviet Union, or he testifies to the Congress in the United States against involvement of the government in, in, in business. But once they deposit $50,000 into his account, even before the negotiations started. And this is $50,000 in the prices of 1926, 1927. He changes his mind. He comes to Ukraine, and he becomes uh, one of the, of the key people in the construction of the um, Dniprohes. And also, the people who were hired in the United States, many of those who applied for those jobs, they would be working in, in places like Niprohes under Cooper's supervision and supervision of others. So what is going on? What is happening at that time? The industrial production in the Soviet Union is going exactly in the opposite direction from where it, from where it goes in the United States. So uh, there, are, there is new construction, there are new jobs. Um, the program that is underway at that time in the Soviet Union is called industrialization. The task is to prepare the country for what Stalin believes will be the next war with the West. The only question that the government has at that point is where to get the money. Where to get the money to pay Cooper, where to get the money to pay other experts that uh, are coming to, to Ukraine and to other republics of the Soviet Union, how to pay General Electrics and others who produce turbines and who produce equipment for the Soviet tractor factories and so on and so forth. Well, and it is around that time that not only the policy of industrialization is being started, but also the policy of collectivization, which in a nutshell means taking control over the agriculture, agricultural economy and agricultural production, and squeezing it out and getting money, hard currency, by export of grain and paying for the <clears throat> cost that is incurred by, by the rapid industrialization. So uh, indeed, uh, in 1929, we see the start of collectivization exactly around the time of the start of the Great Depression in the United States, around the time when all these advertisements appear in the American and uh, in the US and North American newspapers about, about hires to the Soviet Union. And uh, by um, 1932, you see that Dniprohes is, the, the construction is complete. The cost of it, the estimated cost was $50 million. Again, the, the prices of 1932. It went eight times the, 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 the amount that was projected at the very beginning. So that means that someone had to get somewhere hot currency. And uh, people like uh, Colonel Cooper, uh, they were awarded with the order of, uh, apart from uh, money remuneration, they were awarded with the order for the red banner of labor. There were six or seven American consultants who got that. So uh, in October and November of 1932, the, officially, the official opening of the Dniprohes is taking place. Uh, speeches are said, communism is praised, but anyone who would wander outside of the construction side of the Dniprohes into the villages would actually see immediately where the money came from, because the Ukrainian village was bracing itself for the coming famine. Again, the push started, as I said, around 1929 with the program of rapid collectivization it uh, provokes mass resistance on the part of Ukrainian peasantry. In the spring of 1930, the GPU, the secret police, registers around 1,700 different forms of revolt and protest. 
the uh, villages that were located on the border with Poland, the entire villages are raising up and moving toward, to, to, toward the border, so it's a major crisis. Under these conditions, Stalin backs up and, and says that, well, we, we uh, really didn't mean the collectivization to be so rapid. It's the guys on, 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 uh, on the local level that screwed up things. We are not going to do that, of course, uh, by the summer of 1930, there is another, there is another uh, push to do, to do the same. And uh, by 1930, the absolute majority of the households in Ukraine being formally collectivized. So what that means that when they get into the year 1931, there is the, the whole economic structure of, the, of, 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 of rural areas is in chaos. The peasants who are forced to join the collective farms, they of course have no incentives to, to do anything and produce anything. And by the fall of 1931, you see that the whole Soviet project of industrialization, of construction of Dnipro has, of getting ready for the next war is in jeopardy because actually the grain the resources that they are getting out of the village are actually going down and not up. And it is at that time, in, in the fall of 1931, on an uh, <clears throat> autumn day like this, 85 years ago, that you see the representatives of the party cells and the, the heads of the collective farms are starting knocking on the doors of the peasants in the villages south of Kiev and demanding, demanding um, new um, contributions to the, uh, to, 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 to the state coffers. And uh, that is exactly where the story that is known today as the Holodomor or the Great Ukrainian Famine of 1932-1933 really starts. It starts in the fall of 1931, with the government actually, the, the whole system in the, in the countryside collapsing, and the government using uh, more and more um, um, brutal ways to extract resources, to extract grain from, from the peasants. Uh, we have a uh, very interesting um, explanations of what is happening and how it was happening from no, uh, not a lesser figure than the uh, head of the Ukrainian government at that time, Vlas Chubar, who was writing to Joseph Stalin explaining what was going on in the fall of 1931 and then how in, 19, in the spring of 1932 people already started to die from famine. So, and I'll quote, so that's what uh, Chuba writes to Stalin, the failure of legume and spring crops in those rayons or regions above all was not taken into account and the insufficiency of those crops was made up with foodstuffs in order to fulfill the grain requisition plans. Given the overall impossibility of fulfilling the grain requisition plan, the basic reason for which was the lesser harvest in Ukraine as a whole and the colossal losses incurred during the harvest, a result of the weak economic organization of the collective farms and their utterly inadequate management from the rayons and from the center. A system was put in place of confiscating all grain produced by individual farmers, including seed stocks, and more, almost wholesale confiscation of all produce from the collective farms. Uh, this is, this is as, as smoking gun as it gets. Again, it comes from the, uh, from the summer of 1932, describing the, uh, the, the start of the famine in the regions south, south of Kiev. And uh, that is very interesting in its own right, this particular region where the famine starts. That's also where most of the people die eventually in the course also of the famine that would continue in 1932-1933. And that was something really very, very unusual in terms of the history of Ukrainian famines as a whole. Famines as, as such 
are not, not absolutely new phenomenon for any agricultural-based uh, economy, and for Ukraine as well. But uh, the Ukrainian famine and the Holodomor of 1932-1933 was very different. And it happened in different places than the famines were happening before. And that was one of the, of the um, reasons, that was one of the beginnings of research that we started, as I said, approximately five years ago at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, looking at the footprint of, of the Ukrainian famine, uh, of, of the Holodomor, and comparing it also to the, to the famines that were happening before that. Well, uh, Professor Sisson mentioned here the, the attempts of the Soviet authorities, certainly in the 1970s and 1980s, to um, not only stop, not, not only preclude the research on the history of famine in Ukraine, but also stop whatever research and whatever activities associated with famine that were taking place here. Um, now we have, again, uh, in, in the last year or two, in the last year really after the Revolution of Dignity, we see the opening of the KGB archives and new evidence becomes available on the way how the KGB was trying to stop the, the research and hold more activities here, including providing the uh, information, uh, the, the, the so-called compromat, all sorts of negative information on the people who testified for the uh, film on the, on the famine that was shot here in, 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 in Canada and in the United States and uh, also uh, um, supporting, supporting publication of books like uh, the one that in the title had this phrase from Hitler to, to, to Harvard. Uh, again, uh, we have sources uh, uh, in terms of how it was happening, who was doing that, the, the operation was called Farisei. Uh, but in 1991, situation changed. Situ situation changed uh, to a great degree because of the efforts of Ukrainian diaspora. And the question is, what, what did we get after 1991? What we know today about the famine that we didn't know then, and what we can add to that, to, to that knowledge that was there? Well, one thing that became quite obvious was that, of course, witnesses that survived not only in diaspora, but in Ukraine, they started to write their, they were interviewed, they were, they, they were writing their memoirs. That was a great boost and extension of the source base on the history of the famine and Holodomor. Uh, the actual documents, I, I mentioned to you the opening of the KGB archives, the actual documents appeared as well. Uh, but what became very clear and became very obvious that this ex expansion of the source base not necessarily meant immediately better understanding of what happened. Because people who survived the famine can, can talk about their own experience, about the experience of their family. Uh, maximum maybe village, we, do we don't get a bigger picture. You go to the archives, and the sources that, you are, that are supposed to be there, they're not there because there would be in the 1930s an uh, orchestrated campaign of removing those documents from the, from the uh, <clears throat> archives. And then the question of statistics. We till today are trying to figure out how many exactly people died in Holodomor. And one of the reasons why we are at loss and wh why we are still debating one uh, with other <coughs> is that the statistics are so bad. Statistics are bad for a number of reasons. Uh, sometimes if, 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 if the village dies out, there is no one to take, to take records. Uh, other situation was that uh, Right in certain things, in terms of the um, in terms of the cause of death, was absolutely absolutely prohibited. Um, I, I remember um, discussion with my um, grandmother who survived the famine, and I, I read somewhere in the book saying that well, in the Soviet statistics, they took the losses from the famine and added to the people who died in the in um, World War II, which uh, then turned out to be not true, but 
that argument at some point was made. And she looked at me in, in, in disbelief and said, no one counted those people, which, which people were dying, and, and there were no people who were counting them. So it's a it's, it's very, it's very uh, difficult task now to figure out not only how many people died, but also where they died. And in that sense, the study of Holodomor and study of famine really entered a new uh, stage. And that stage is when it's not enough to be a journalist and go and interview people and, and, and write about the famine. It's not enough to be a historian and study the archival sources and, and, and try to write about that. Really, we enter in the, the, the um, situation in which the study of Holodomor becomes more like a social science as opposed to history, which is a part of humanities. You have to work with people and in different, in different areas, which have different expertise. And one group of those people without whom it, it's really difficult to make sense out of what happened are the demographers. And uh, again, uh, we at, 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 at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute were really very lucky to work with the fantastic group of demographers led by Oleg Volovina from the United States. But the core uh, <clears throat> people uh, are coming from Ukraine from the Institute of Demography. So these are the people who did absolutely fantastic research counting and, and, and thinking about migrations, out migrations and people who are coming to Ukraine. Uh, thinking and creating formulas for how count those things who were not, as my grandmother was saying, were not counted. Taking the sources that are there, going to Moscow and finding them also in the Moscow archives. So that was one, one big chunk of work which was done for the, for the project and th for the production of the maps that I am going to show you. <clears throat> Another thing is that once we got this data, what we tried to do, we tried to do the uh, latest uh, uh, um, available uh, methodologies that existed in geography and, and, and in, in study of geography and luckily Harvard had a lot of expertise in that re regard, and we started to build databases out of all sorts of information. The, the number of deaths, the number of GPU arrests, the level of collectivization, the level of urbanization, and so on and so forth, that then eventually would produce the maps that the GIS, GI informative system, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, again, the methodology that was used for us to take these databases and actually bring them into, into uh, uh, to, to, to show them on the level of the map. Um, the question that we were trying to answer um, working on, on these maps was uh, not just how many people died or where they died, but also trying, by answering these questions, figure out why Ukraine became, uh, became really the most hit in terms of the collectivization, in terms of the famine, the most hit region of the entire Soviet Union. The famine of 1932, 1933 was not limited to Ukraine, but it was in Ukraine that most of the people died and the question was why. Uh, we have, of course, answers that are coming, ca coming from political scientists, from historians, from others. There are issues of culture, there are issues of resistance during the, the revolution and civil war, of the peasant mobilization, all of that is there. We were trying to ask the same kind of questions and look at them using different data, different sources, different databases, and also different different methodology. So <clears throat> let me start with the very general map that we, okay, and somehow it used to move and now it doesn't. Okay, I, I will bear with me, I will go to this map now. Okay, this is our composite map 
of, uh, again, just to remind you, and you probably don't need a reminder, that this is not the map of today's Ukraine. This is the map of interwar Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, the territory on which the, the, the Holodomor took place. And what is missing there is, of course, the Western Ukraine with Galicia and Transcarpathia and, and Volhynia. What is missing there is also the Crimea that at that time was part of the Russian Federation. So that is, that is the area that was under the, under the control, under the supervision of the communist government and communist authorities in the city of Kharkiv. And uh, this is uh, the, the regions that you see there, again, are not today's oblasts. These are the oblasts that existed in 1932-1933. We got really unlucky because in 32-33, they changed the administrative borders in Ukraine at least four times. So for us to get data from March and be a, of 1932 and be able to use it for February of 1933, we had to go through a multiple mapping and remapping and, and recalculation, especially our demographic team. They, 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 they did a wonderful job recalculating those things again because the borders and, and the way how the reporting was happening within those borders, they were changing. So uh, that's, that's the map that we got, and you see those columns, and they basically indicate the years where most of the people died, and you see that the famine of 1932-1933, according to demographic data, really covered three years. People were dying in 1934. Not dozens, not hundreds, tens of thousands of people were dying in, in 1934, when we normally and, and the, the, the date in 1933. Uh, the, uh, most of the people who died in 1934 were not already in the countryside, but in the small towns and also in the, in the cities. Well, we were really surprised, even shocked. This is not, this is not the map that we were uh, prepared to see. And, why we were surprised? Because we didn't expect that those red oblasts, the, the, the Kiev and Kharkiv oblasts, would be the most affected ones. We were looking at the sources, we were looking at other famines, we were listening to what the, the, the politicians, the pronouncements that they were making, and everyone was saying that famine hit the hardest southern parts of Ukraine, the main grain producing areas, which here are the Odessa and Dnipropetrovsk oblasts and also the southern part of Donetsk and, and Luhansk oblast. And our demographers got it all wrong, we thought. It's, it, 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 it can't be true. So, something is wrong with that. They, they, they went back, they did their math again, they came back with the same, with the same numbers and with the same uh, map. So a footprint Just a sec. <clears throat> okay, this is the map. Uh, at the top, you see the same map that I showed you before. But now what we got, we got the data based on the rayon. There were more than 400 rayons in, the, in uh, Ukraine at that time. So we can get a better understanding of where exactly people were dying. So it, it's not now, it looks like not the entire Kiev Oblast, but the regions around Kiev and to the south, and not entire Kharkiv Oblast and so on and so forth. So we got a better understanding of where that was happening. But the most important here is the map at the bottom. And the map at the bottom, this is the famine-stricken areas of the previous famine of 1921-1923. That's where the famines were happening in Ukraine before that. These are steppe areas, they're very productive. It's black earth, but they're also open to the suddenly, sudden changes in the weather. It's, it's, it's enough, the frost to, to, to hit for, I don't know, one day or something like that, and the crops are gone. 
You go back to the 19th century, as I said, famine is not something that was invented in the 20th century. Famine is, to, unfortunately, was a normal part of the, of the peasant life, or starvation at least. And again, it's the same story. It's the southern areas of Ukraine. You move forward, you go to the famine of 1947-1948. The same story, Odessa, Kherson, uh, Zaporizhia, they hit the most, but the footprint of the Holodomor is different. So that was our first discovery. Not that we didn't know that it was different in a sense that there was the government intervention, but now we saw that the, what our demographers were given actually was maybe not a, completely, a complete invention. Maybe they were right. The Holodomor has a very different geography. The Holodomor has a very different footprint from any famine that can be theoretically called natural or semi-natural, either of 47, 48, or 21, 23, or the famines of the 19th century. It took place in the so-called parklands, in the, in, the, in the forested areas in center of Ukraine, where normally they're not tremendously productive, but normally famines don't, don't happen there. Well, and then, of course, uh, the uh, question was, why? What happened? And with, again, for those of you who are in science, know that we, we historians normally, we have it easy. We already have an answer. We, don't, we know how history ended. So our question is just to put things together so that it would, uh, with science is differently. With science you get these results and you are trying, trying to figure out what, what is going on and you try comparing this and that and that didn't work and you put two months of work and, and somehow the map that was showing GPU arrests has no correlation to, to, to the, or, or very little correlation to uh, the, the map of the death. And then we hit it, we found it. There is two maps where there is a correlation between the regions where people were dying and those maps. And these uh, two maps that I am showing to you. The first one is the ecological zones of Ukraine. And it is there in the middle that people were dying. Not in the south, not in the steppe, not in the forest. As I told you before, that was in the forested areas. Now, well, the, here is another surprise, okay. So what? <laughs> yes, that's what is happening, but, 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 but how, how is that? And, and, and we think that it's probably the government that, that, that caused all of that. So what, is, what, what, what relation there is between government and, and the ecological zones in Ukraine? Well, there is a relation. We are not the first one who discovered that Ukraine was divided into different ecological zones. The government in Moscow was there first. And they looked at the south as the main grain producing areas of Ukraine and in the entire Soviet Union. They, according to their planning, fall into the same category as Ukrainian Kuban regions and, Nish, and, and southern Volga region. So that's where the grain was. That's where the money for Colonel Cooper was. The task was to go there and get that money. How do you do that? You do that through collectivization. You take control over resources. So at the bottom, there is a map of collectivization, levels of collectivization in Ukraine. So the collective farms, first and foremost, were introduced in the south, which would have actually tremendous impact on the way how the situation was developing in 1931, 1932, 1933. Our traditional thinking was, okay, they're trying to get grain, they're bringing their collective farms, so that means that where there are more collective farms, there probably should be more death. No, our maps don't work that way. So we had to look for other reasons and for other explanations. And one of them is that, of course, those who are not collectivized, those whom the government didn't push in collective form, it, it is trying to push them and it increases taxation. 
And then, when in 1933 they understand that hundreds of thousands of people dying who are supposed to produce grain for them and trying to save what they can, where the assistance would go? Assistance would go to, to the south. Assistance would go to the collective farms as well. And I, I <clears throat> will be happy to show you uh, the maps that, that indicate just that. But let me first, let me first uh, go back and go back to this uh, uh, fall of 1931, the spring of 1932, the very beginning of the famine, and uh, look at exactly at how is it happening and what, what are the, <clears throat> the, the contributing factors. Um, So these are the two maps. On the left, there is a map of the famine of 1932-1933, so the first year of starvation and famine. That's the one that comes on the heels of this requisition campaign in the fall of 1931. It's given on the, on the level of uh, big oblasts, not small rayons. And on the right, there is a map uh, on the uh, basically stocks, on the, on the food stocks in the Ukrainian villages and where the peasantry were better off and where they were, they were not so, so doing so good. And where the color is more intense, the, this orange color in the south, that's where people had actually more food stocks. Uh, grain, potato, they were richer, land was richer, the, 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 the originally, even before the revolution of 1917, the plots were bigger and so on and so forth. So they were able to survive longer, even if the, if the requisitions were there, than the peasantry in the central and, and northern, northern parts of Ukraine. And that means that once the first wave of requisition hits the uh, regions in Kiev and Kharkiv Oblast, they have really very little to go on. I started, or at the beginning of my talk, I quoted from the letter of Las Chuber, the head of the Ukrainian communist government in Kharkiv to Stalin. And uh, it was just a quote. He also explains, uh, Chuber explains to Stalin what was going on, what was happening. And he says that the first to succumb to starvation, the first to die, were the families with a lot of children. They had to feed those children, they couldn't and uh, also the, the uh, families that didn't join the collective farms because they were taxed, they were taxed at, 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 at higher level. Um, what is happening is that after the famine of 1932, those people in Kiev and Kharkiv Oblast, they really didn't have any more energy, those who survived to do sowing in the spring of 1932. And then when the new wave of requisitions came in the fall of 1932, they were actually, again, the first to die. So the, one of the reasons why we have that original map that I showed you with Kiev and Kharkiv being so prominent, because they got two years of famine, and they never had a chance to recover from the first wave, and they were hit they were hit with the second wave. Um, I'll, I'll give you another quote from the private diary of the party official Dmitro Zavoloka in Kiev region, who was arrested, diary was taken by the secret police, was preserved in those archives and is known to us. That's what he writes. Grain was requisitioned right up to the top. What they found in the granaries and the houses was taken, almost to the last pound. And the poor or middle peasant or collective farmer often had his last put of grain taken away because someone said that he was hiding kulak grain or kurkul grain. In certain places, grain requisition turned into cruel treatment of the inhabitants, bordering on usurpation. Also, very often, they dekulakized kulaks who were never kulaks at all, but they came up with any odd reason and sold 
sold the farm. So that is, that is an eyewitness account, not of the kind that we normally hear of survivors, but this is a party official in the cave oblast who actually traveled the region and actually saw what was happening and was in a position to assess the, the, the impact, the overall impact of what was, what was happening there. Now, um, <clears throat> uh, going back to, uh, to um, uh, mm, the theme with which I started the lecture, and this is, this is the um, need for, for money for, for, for industrialization and, and requisition of, of grain. Uh, the name for requisition was, was procurement. And um, another very interesting correlation that we found between our maps was that the better certain regions were at fulfilling their procurement quotas, the lesser chances of survival they had. So if you are good at fulfilling the government quotas, you are the first in the line to die. And again, for reason that, again, we're still, we still working on that, we're still trying to figure out how that was happening and what was happening, but the level of the fulfillment of procurement quotas in the fall of 1932 in the central parts of Ukraine was higher than, than uh, in the south. It doesn't mean that they actually produced or turned to, to the government more grain, but in terms of the quotas that they were set, their percentage of fulfilling of those quotas was high. And again, there is a direct relation between the high quotas and the high levels, the high levels of death as well. Um, the news about, about the people uh, starving and, and, and dying in mass started to get to, to Kharkiv already at the beginning of the year 1933. It is exactly at the time when the government was going there and now with the task and with the order to get everything, every food stock from the peasants because they were accused of hiding grain from the government. And uh, by the March, by February and March of 1933, the party officials on, in Ukraine uh, started to uh, be uh, really concerned about what was going on because apart everything else, that meant that they were losing people who were supposed to fulfill those quotas in the future. But most of them would be silent. Most of them would be silent and there was a good reason for that. By the year 1933, and I'm maybe a little bit shaky on those, on those figures, but close to 40% of the head of the party cells and the head of the collective farms, who were not willing to fulfill the party orders and take the um, um, bread from the starving peasantry, were already removed from, them, from their positions and uh, sent to exile, sent to prison. Um, uh, that, that was uh, uh, partly the story of my family. Um, my grand-grandfather, whom I still remember, was a director of collective farm in, the, in southern Ukraine. And uh, uh, he was arrested in the fall of 1932. Uh, they put him in prison in the regional center of Zaporizhia. And I don't know how, but in February of 1933, he was released. He went back to uh, his village. He took his entire family and they fled. They stopped in Kamchatka. So that's, that's where my father grew up. Uh, and again, the, the out-migration was one, uh, one of the ways, actually, of how people, how people were surviving. But by 1933, those who stayed, they were really the kind of cadres that Joseph Stalin wanted to have. They were the cadres that were prepared to go there and actually take the grain from, from dying peasantry. Um, 
they were silent when people were dying because on line was not just their career, it was also their freedom and it was the life of their families. Uh, one, one of the first who started actually to write to, to um, Kharkiv and, and to Moscow was the first secretary of Dnipropetrovsk Oblast, um, whose last name was Khatayevich. And there was a good reason why he was, he was actually more willing to talk than others. Apart from being the first secretary of the uh, Dnipropetrovsk Oblast, he was also the second secretary of the All Ukrainian Central Committee and was in close relations with Kaganovich and New Stalin personally. So he had enough political capital to risk and he started to, to um, one of the first who started to um, mm, correspond with the center that something has to be done. And uh, it is in the March and April and then in May of 1933 that you see that the government in Moscow starts to release reserves to um, stop or at least alleviate the famine. Again, very interesting at how they do that and where do they send their help. By the spring of 1933, the mostly affected areas of Ukraine by famine are the Kiev and Kharkiv oblasts. But when you see where the resources go from Moscow, they're going, and you can see that by the, by the size of this green circle, they're going to the south. They're going to the south because that's, that's where the main grain producing areas are. They want to feed people who produce grain, and it becomes the Kharkiv government's concern what to do with Kharkiv and, 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 and uh, Kyiv Oblast, and they have very little in terms of the resources to release. But the Moscow actually couldn't care less about people dying in central Ukraine. When I shared the, the results of this of research that we did and, and preliminary conclusions that we draw from it with Anne Applebaum, she said, well, this is exactly what is happening in Gulag. They're feeding those who still can work. The rest can die. And that's, that's also an important part of the, of the story of Holodomor, and this is also part of the explanation of why the, the, the footprint of the Holodomor, of the famine of 1932-1933, is different from the one that we are getting from, from different, from, uh, again, 21-23, and then 47-48 famines and famines of the 19th century. Uh, just a sec, I will, hopefully I will, okay. Somehow it's not there anymore. Okay, I have it on the screen and we don't have anyone who can help with that, right? Because what I want, I want this map to be on the screen. Yes. Thanks, miracle. <laughs> um, that, that will be the last map that I will show you, but um, it, it's an important one. This is, this is the map that specifically tells exactly where, where most of the people were dying. This is on rayon level, 400 level rayons. And the, the darkest of them are the Rayons where up to 50% of people in the villages died. Among those, those villages and those rayons were rayons from uh, which uh, Ivan Drach, for example, came. Uh, so up, up, up to 50% and then lower percentage after that. And what you see again, the, 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 the most hit areas are on the uh, border between Kiev, Uman region, between uh, Kiev and Vinnytsia region, and then Poltava uh, on, the, on the left bank. Uh, Uman region was known for producing of sugar bits. And that's how they fulfilled their quotas, by 
producing sugar beets. But in 1932, they went to them and started to take grain. They didn't produce grain per se in, 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 in big numbers. But grain, that's what was wanted and grain, grain was taken from them. Now, let me talk a little bit about the areas that were less affected by famine and why is it so? So far, my main explanation of the results that we got was that there was ecological differences, there were differences in the terms of the ability of the regions to produce grain. That influenced the position of the Moscow government and that's what they were doing and that's, that's, that's the, the, main, the, 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 the main explanation for that map. But there are a number of other important questions that this map really produces. And one of them is why people were dying more in the northern areas of Luhansk, which today stay Ukrainian, and why they were dying less in, in southern Luhansk Oblast, and why they were dying less in Stalino, or around Dnipropetrovsk. What was there? Well, part of the explanation is south, and we, we know that story. But another part is that this is exactly the areas where the money goes taken from the Ukrainian villages and it goes to the mines of Donbass, to the metallurgical enterprises of Zaporizhia and Dnipropetrovsk. And that's how another part of my family survived, by going to Zaporizhia and working at the, at the brick factories there and so on and so forth. So the industrial southeast that's where people actually had a chance to survive by getting on the train and going to the, to the cities or to the uh, uh, settlers of the mining settlers. That's where the central supply of food was. Again, people were dying there as well. You see that it's not white area completely, but they were dying at a lesser levels. That was a chance for survival. So industrialization, industrial development helped, helped that part of, of Ukraine to do better. Now, let's go to the, to the border with Poland. It's on the, on, the left, on the left side. Somehow, famine is not as, as severe there as it was in other parts of Ukraine. And the reason is, again, the same, the policies of the government. You remember I was telling you the first reaction to the collectivization of 1929, uh, 1930? The peasants are in revolt, and especially those who are close to the border. Well, the Soviet government not only increased the number of border guards, they also decided that those areas actually have to be treated differently when it comes to the requisition of grain because they're on the border, they constitute a threat, security threat, they can actually go, they, they, they can disappear, we can lose them. Losing them to famine is okay, losing them to go into Poland is a political embarrassment. And one more interesting area, Chernihiv. What is going on there? and northern oblasts of Kyiv oblast, and northern regions of Kyiv oblast. Well, that's where the ecology works not in favor of the government, but against the government. In the forest area, you can't take away all food products. The forest continues to feed you. This is one resource one food resource that the government is not able to control. So we have these areas or oases of survival. We have the areas that are hit the most, and then we have the oases of survival. Good, what does all this mean? What, what did we add to our understanding of what Holodomor was and Holodomor wasn't about? Well, uh, let me recap some of the points that I made in my presentation so far. 
The geography of losses suffered by the population of Ukraine in the course of the Great Famine of 32-33 sets it apart from the earlier famines of 1920s, which occurred in the southern parts of the Republic. During the Great Famine, the death rate was highest in central Ukraine. An explanation for the distinct geography of the Great Famine should be sought in the different treatment of Ukraine's regions, first by the Soviet government in Moscow and then by the Ukrainian leadership in Kharkiv. While Stalin and the members of his inner circle treated Ukraine as an entity with regard uh, to grain procurements, they also distinguished the main grain producing areas in the steppe zone of southern Ukraine from the boreal zones of central and northern Ukraine, which grew less grain or none at all. The steppe regions of Ukraine were more highly collectivized and supplied with tractors and other agricultural machinery on a priority basis. They were also the first to receive famine relief assistance and were the main benefactors of resettlement policy after the famine. The boreal steppe regions of Ukraine, which included Kyiv, Kharkiv, and Vinnytsia Oblast, had a lower level of collectivization and mechanization of agriculture. The central government's policy of forcing peasants to join collective farms by imposing higher procurement quotas on non-collectivized peasantry further disadvantaged the central and northern areas of Ukraine, which had a lower level of collectivized households than the steppe regions in the south. And finally, while Kyiv and Kharkiv oblasts were hardest hit by the Holodomor, the losses in other parts of Ukraine were also in the millions, totaling at least 3.9 million deaths, according to the latest estimate. The death toll that set the Holodomor apart from the earlier famines, not only in terms of geography, but also in the absolute number of victims. But the number of victims, the main focus of my talk, is not the only thing that distinguishes Holodomor from other famines. The Holodomor came at the same time with the attack of Stalin on the Ukrainian party elite at that time, which meant the curtailing of the autonomous status of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. From now on, after the famine, it became just a province of the Soviet Union. We're gone people like Skripnik who committed suicide, were gone people like uh, um, uh, Mykola Khvilovy. There is attack on the, on the uh, uh, party cadres was uh, happening at the same time with attack on Ukrainian culture. And if Ukrainian language stayed in the school under the party control in Ukraine, what happened in the middle of the famine in December of 1932, that all Ukrainian programs, cultural, linguistic, and otherwise, were stopped outside of Ukraine, turning hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, if not millions, in Kuban region, in Saratov region, in, in, in the Far East, into Russians, according to their passport, within just one, one moment. Ukrainians constituted the largest minority, non-Russian minority on the territory of the Russian Federation until the famine of 1932-1933. Those numbers were reduced to almost nothing after the famine. And last but not least, collectivization of the agriculture, of which famine was an important part because it delivered peasantry the lesson that the party wanted to deliver. Either you join the collective farm or you die. The collectivization of agriculture actually disrupted the ages, ages long culture of Ukrainian peasantry. It destroyed the Ukrainian peasantry as such. So there was a political effect, there was cultural effect, there was social effect, and this is on the top of at least four million people dying. And uh, unfortunately the famine had released, if not completely broken, the ability of the Ukrainian society to resist for generations to come. And the agriculture never really recovered after the shock of 1932-1933. By 1940, as a result of the Soviet industrialization campaign, the industrial production in Ukraine increased to, from three to four times compared to 1913, 
the last year before World War I, when the production, agricultural production increased only by 13%. After the Second World War, the industrial production was rebuilt by the year 1950. The agriculture didn't recover until early 1960s. The collective farms didn't work and the peasants didn't want to work there. Today, in the conditions of the war in Donbass, in the conditions of the um, annexation of the Crimea, agricultural sector became the most vibrant and the most important sector of Ukrainian economy that actually contributes the most to the Ukrainian budget today. This is in the conditions of war, in the conditions of, of uh, uh, economic decline and so on and so on, but also in the conditions of the absence of the collective farms. And on this at least half optimistic note, I want to conclude my uh, presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, you mentioned the Kuban and Saratov regions. Um, have you been doing similar mappings? Uh, because I imagine that that would be even more of a testament of, of ethnic targeting of uh, the regime's policies. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, Kuban case is actually exceptionally uh, important case for exactly uh, the question of ethnic targeting. Because there you see a clear, clear signs that you don't see in Ukraine where the authorities are going specifically after the Ukrainian settlements in Kuban. Um, again, a lot in, in terms of what we do and what we don't do depends on access to information. Uh, demographers are there, they are dedicated, they are prepared to work on that. Uh, now the uh, war with Russia actually precluded the possibility of going to, to Moscow and to work in those archives, mentioning anything like collectivization or famine, of course, would, would not be very productive. Uh, but um, on the basis of the data that is there, Oleh uh, Volovina, um, Natalia, well, and 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 Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian colleagues of Oleh, uh, they um, created uh, the data, and they created also map maps with our help, which is not as specific, but has Russia divided into two areas, central and northern, where the famine almost didn't occur, and then southern regions of Russia. But that's the degree that we were able to get to at, at this point. What we really want, what is, what is our next step and where we would like to move, and we started to move, but then again, all this war conditions cha uh, change the situation. We want to have and to do the same kind of research, not on the remoted areas like Volga or even Kuban. We want to look at what is happening on the borders with, let's say, uh, Chernihiv Oblast, on the, on the borders of Kharkiv Oblast, where the ecological conditions are the same, and to see whether people die more or less, again, and we know that they're dying less, and then go and to look into the kind of sources that we have for the Ukrainian side. What were the, the requisition quotas? Because in the case of Ukraine, the republic that produced 27% of grain ended up to be responsible for 38% of the supplies to the, to the state and to the government. Uh, that's, that's what we want to, we want to compare apples and apples. So the, 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 the regions, because ecology turned out to be so important for us and was so important for the, for the Soviet planning, we want to compare regions that would be next to each other. And that means getting statistics on the death, which is PFBD, we, we, we kind of could get that. But more importantly, the level of the source base that we have for Ukraine today as a result of 25 years of work of, of Ukrainian historians in Ukraine in those archives. No one did that for, for Rostov Oblast, and no one did that for Kursk Oblast, and so on and so forth. So, but that's, that's really where we want to go, that's where we want to be. May I ask? The, hmm? Yes, sorry. Um, 
Sergei, thank, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. I, uh, you mentioned uh, in, in your presentation, but I didn't go into detail, resettlement after the famine. Have, are you planning to do a similar um, analysis of where people came from and where they were actually resettled? Because this new concept actually changes a little bit our understanding of what the resettlement meant. We, from the popular understanding was that after the famine, people from Russia and Belarus was brought, were brought into certain areas, and these areas are now more Russified than Ukrainian. While if they were brought into the hardest hit areas, these areas are Ukrainian today. They were not; they are not the Russified areas. Will you be um, following the, following up this? Well, thanks. Excellent question. Hennady um, Femenko uh, is the one who really is an expert on that and published published a number of important works which basically dispel this popular mythology. The uh, resettlement is taking place, but it's not on the level that would shift really the, the, the balance, ethnic balance in, in the regions. From the research that we did and the documents that I saw, uh, it's 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 a, it's it's an interesting, uh, uh, basically, uh, story which stresses one more the, the 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 cynicism of the of the state and of the government. After the famine, after the 1932-1933 famine, not only people from Russia, from Belarus, are being resettled to the southern Ukraine, to southern Ukraine, not to central Ukraine. They are needed there to produce grain. Many of them don't want, because they go, they see what, what, what the ruin those villages are, so the, the government issues the decree that don't allow peasants from Russia to send their representatives to Ukraine to see and then report back. Just take them and ship them there. But where the, 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 the top of cynicism comes is that people from Kyiv and Kharkiv Oblast are resettled to southern Ukraine to replenish the, the, the losses of the famine, and basically they didn't care about the central Ukraine. So that's, that's what, what uh, uh, again, uh, part of this story, again, the, the, the center privileges south. Uh, two questions. <clears throat> so do you consider the Holodomor to be genocide, or just, not just, but a, p a severe push for collectivization. And the second question is, I've read that the Soviets prevented people from leaving their villages, but you mentioned that your family went to Dnipropetrovsk. So did they allow that sort of movement into the industrial areas? Well, they, uh, uh, I'll start with, with, with the second question. Uh, they blocked the, the, the borders of uh, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. They also blocked the famine uh, stricken areas in Kuban, and I'm not sure about Volga, but basically that was a standard practice, and the idea was that not to allow peasants from the famine-stricken areas to go to other areas and spread information of what was going on and not to undermine the the, the, the collectivization effort there. So that is, that is what is happening. But there is no, uh, the, the, there are no, uh, uh, again, as far as I know, attempts to stop, for example, peasants to go to the mines of Donbass or to the industrial enterprises in Zaporizhia. So that is, that is not happening. And regarding out migration out of the Republic, again, it all would depend on the, on the particular circumstances. I didn't do research on that. My own family history says that uh, my grandfather was already as part, uh, uh, who was drafted in the army, was already in the Kamchatka. So I guess I, I, I would have to do additional research. He could actually send them an invitation or something like that, so that could, could make their, 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 their exit easier. But again, within Ukraine itself, there would be no limitations on that. One of the, of the um, again, uh, parts of the story about center of Ukraine suffering the most was that also they were the, the, the further away from all borders of Ukraine. You need, you need energy, at least some energy, to get on the train, to go somewhere. If you're already starving, 
you, you have difficulty getting out of your village. And, and they're really at the very center, and, and that's not where a lot of uh, railroads are and things like that. They're, 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 they're in different areas. So they're really in the, in the middle of nowhere in terms of the, of the traffic in infrastructure. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the genocide, I uh, think that the Holodomor has a number of markers of genocide. And in particular, there was mention of Kubain. I, I think that there are very clear elements of uh, the government going after the ethnic Ukrainian settlements. As a whole, our research shown that the um, mm, we don't see really differentiation or the policies that are based on the ethnicity within the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Uh, the areas, for example, in Kharkiv Oblast that suffered the most, there would be a quite significant percentage of ethnic Russians. You go to the Podolia and Volin, there would be quite significant percentage of the Jews as well. Uh, especially in the small towns, which were not supplied at all. So we didn't see really the, uh, we, we, we see a very significant, again, this geographic ecological factor playing there. We saw, uh, it's outside of our research, but very clear effort to crush Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic and its elites, cultural, political, and otherwise, as an as a, um, autonomous entity. So it is there. Uh, in terms of the ethnic, ethnic differentiation, at least our data doesn't show that. There was okay. What I, one of the um, aspects of uh, genocide um, could be uh, against a, a subset of the Ukrainian and Russian population of the Cossacks, because you see, um, in the first famine in the 20s, it was uh, Zaporizhia was actually the worst hit city according to people, and in the south, so that was a um, you know related to the civil war they wanted to punish them say but then in the north you see there some places there there Zaporizhia was hit twice some of those places so it's almost as if they really wanted to stamp out Zaporizhia area like because it's so associated with cause and then you get the Kuban. it's so I think there's a strong correlation but I'm not sure which Thank you. Well, in terms of, of um, you, you, you doing independent research, one thing that I wanted to stress is that these maps that I am showing, they're, they're out there on the website of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. There is a gallery of close to 40 maps different. You can go and look at them. There is also an interactive map where you can put different layers and see whether the correlation is there or not, so you can do your own research. And the, the uh, famine is the most developed, but one of the four modules that we have in this website, which is called MAPA, Digital Atlas of Ukraine. So the, chronologically, the first module deals, it's a map of Europe, not of Ukraine, but it tracks the matrimonial ties of the Kievan princes. Yaroslav the Wise had this, this reputation of uh, or, or a nickname of the um, uh, of the of the uh, father-in-law of entire Europe because Anna Yaroslavna and others were were, were sent to, to, to the royal uh, to the royal courts all over Europe. So we have that for a number of centuries, and you can look and, and click and see the data in terms of who those women were, who men were when they married, who were their uh, children, and so on and so forth. Another is dealing with 14th, 15th, 16th century Podolia, and this is the history of the settlement. This is the most important part of the long durée Ukrainian history of settle, settling the, 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 the south, settling the, the, the steppe areas. Then we have famine, and most of our Effort, research, resources today goes toward the development of the module on contemporary Ukraine. We have already a number of so-called uh, story maps uh, where we just, in chronological order, there are different maps showing the attitude toward the idea of the union with Russia, how it is changing between 1994 and 2014. 
And what our data says is basically that there is growing over the period of time, growing um, loyalty of the entire Ukraine toward the idea of Ukrainian statehood. If what happened in the East and what happened in the Crimea would happen, as the Kremlin is saying, because someone just decided to do that in, in, in Donetsk or in Simferopol, the moment when that would have the best chances of taking place was in 1999. Since 1999, we see actually that Crimea and Eastern Ukraine is in terms of their attitudes toward the idea of unified state with Russia. They're in the sync with the rest of Ukraine. And we, we are building huge databases now. We don't have those maps. Fantastic story in terms of the rise of the center in the last 25 years. Depopulation of the East because of the economic collapse, rise of the center and of the West, which also corresponds to the political, uh, political uh, dynamics in today's society. Something, again, you, you can't imagine when, when you put this data, when you work on that, and then it pops and, 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 and shows on the map, and, and you see a completely different picture and different understanding. In terms of the Cossacks, well, again, uh, I, I come from Zaporizhia, so I... I, I I hear you, uh, uh, and, and, and indeed the region was hit in, in the famine of 1921, 1923. Uh, again, just personal story, my grandma was saved by, by the, this uh, Arab, by the, American, by the American assistance agencies sent out of all places to Poltava. Poltava was, of course, hit then in 1932, 1933. So then uh, Ludmila Hrinevich was did fantastic work on the famine of 1928. Again, it's, 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 it's the same areas. Uh, 1932, 1933, they suffered, again, they suffered but not to a degree that Poltava and, and, and Kharkiv suffered. So I, I don't see, again, one would have to continue research. I don't see this direct relation between the Cossack origins of the, of the land and how it fares in different famines. But again, we are here all together doing research and, 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 and discovering new things and, and trying to, to understand them. So it's not, it's not the end of the story. It's maybe just the beginning. I have a question, a couple of questions. Um, how do you, or do you differentiate between those that were killed outright because they didn't want to cooperate with collectivization or were killed or uh, re, uh, um, uh, were moved out of the area and those people that were actually s uh, died and starved uh, in a famine? Like, do you differentiate between that? And the other thing is, how do you get around the fact that a lot of the documentation would have been destroyed because they wouldn't have wanted to know about those that were killed or, or died? Okay. Well, excellent questions. Uh, the answers are provided by our fantastic demographic team, and they, they, they use, I don't know, unbelievable formulas how to, how to deal with that. So that they ask these questions. What uh, the uh, Volovina and his group did for the first time was ex uh, that no one, no demographer did before that, it's exactly accounting for migration, which would include also forceful deportation of, of, of the Kulaks in 1930 and, 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 and then later. So again, it is there, the formula is, is there. And the same is true for the, for the um, uh, number of death, because again, in terms of the registered death and Maybe I am off a little bit, but per se, registered death are a little bit more one million. So, but then there are there are assessments of the the census of 1926, 1937, 1939, uh, counts of migration, all, all sorts of other data that they put together in order to create this figure with which we are working. So again, the the. Uh, spending nights thinking about the kind of questions that you asked and what, what we have is the best what we have now in terms of the, what, what demography can give us. But again, this is not a raw data that is taken from the archives. Uh, yes, uh, I had a couple of questions. Uh, I was intrigued by your uh, references to Canada. 
came up uh, at least twice during her talk. The first time having to do with the release of the KGB archives in, in Kiev and the denigration of the names of Canadians who were, who were working on the famine and publicizing the famine. I'd like you to talk about that a little bit more if you could. The second thing is that um, you mentioned that uh, the long-lasting uh, nature of the results of the famine and uh, poor agricultural uh, input in later years. I recall when I was a, a, a very young person, um, John Diefenbaker was the Prime Minister of Canada, and Canada made very large uh, sales of uh, grain to the Soviet Union. Could you talk about that a little bit as well? Thank you. Um, again, in terms of K KGB involvement, there is more and more things now become known, and there are publications, and I, I, I think that maybe Dr. Hernavich can, uh, can point you uh, in that direction. Uh, what I was saying was based on my recent research in KGB archives in June of this year, and I was working on, on a different topic, or rather a number of topics, and th these things just came across. What, what they have and what is relatively easy to get access to is the so-called uh, font number 16, which is the secretariat of the uh, KGB headquarters in Kyiv, and mostly of the uh, documentation, uh, or a big part of it, documentation that they were sending reports to the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Ukraine, to Sherbitsky and so on. And the data that I am given in terms of the name of the, of the operation of the file, uh, references to the book and things like that, they are mentioned in, in these reports. Reports are very general, but they are talking about, it's a long report coming, it seems to me, from 1989, about uh, all sorts of operations that are there to, to uh, undermine the, the, the unity, basically. The goal is to undermine the unity of uh, the diaspora and to keep the diaspora uh, fighting with each other and basically being uh, distracted by all sorts of things. So Demyanyuk and, and the, the, the case of Demyanyuk is mentioned specifically in this case, uh, with, with basically reporting very positively that, okay, we, we keep them busy instead of mobilizing against us, they now have to deal with, with Demyanyuk, and they're, 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 they're supplying documents. They're also writing and, and asking for, for uh, assistance in, in collecting archival documents and things like that for people coming from Canada. Again, the names, are, are on my computer, I, I don't have them now. They're very general, but they also mention the names of those, of those operations and files, which meant that, means that unless they were destroyed, and apparently a lot of dealing with 1980s was destroyed because that was the officers who were still on duty. Theoretically, you can find more, more details on that, but what, what I was saying was based on my, again, research on a different topic, but that was coming I, I couldn't. I couldn't resist. I, uh, I, I ordered those the, 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 those copies as well. But again, they're the, the, the general, qu quite general. Those reports to the party. Uh, in terms of uh, Diffenbaker and and grain, and this is this is very interesting in a sense that <clears throat> um, the 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 resistance of the of the local party officials and, and heads of the collective farms to what was going on there. I mentioned the number of people who were, who were fired. Um, most of them, again, uh, the, for them probably the trauma remained for a long, long period of time. Th those were their people. What I noticed was also that mostly the, the leaders of the rayons were not coming from that rayon. They were taken more or less from that area, but those were newcomers to the region, so they didn't have their families. In that way, they were helping them to, to, to deal psychologically with, with this absolutely inhumane task. But one of people apparently who had all sorts of regrets, who wasn't uh, involved in, in the famine of 1932, but then was involved in the famine of uh, 47, 48, uh, was Nikita Khrushchev, who is in his memoirs, of course, attacks Stalin for, for, for that particular famine. And it is interesting that at the time when the Soviet Union hits another famine type of a situation uh, in the early 1960s under Nikita Khrushchev, instead of 
getting grain from the peasants and selling it to the West. They're taking hard currency and go to the West and buy grain to alleviate what otherwise would be a famine, which means also a major, major shift and change in terms of the, of the regime per se. Uh, so I, I think what, what happened has a direct relation to the, to the experiences of, of Khrushchev and his generation of, of going through the, through the previous two, two famines. Hello. Hi. Um, first, I want to thank you for your lecture. It was uh, very informative. Um, my father's family in particular, my mother, uh, his mother, so my grandmothers lived in the Poltava region and they ended up um, moving to the Azov Sea and surviving off uh, mainly the, f the fish there. Uh, so my question in, in general is, how do you think the coastal areas in comparison to the forested areas of northern Ukraine compare and did that come into play when into saving lives as well as, uh, let's say, you know, hunting and gathering and things like that? Well, uh, thanks, thanks for this question and, and thanks for this, for this idea and suggestion. I, I didn't think in those terms, or at least our group, we didn't, we didn't raise that kind of questions, but it, it certainly makes perfect sense. C is another forest where, where the government can't, can't really control, control the, or, or take away everything that is there. So thanks, thanks for, for an idea. It, it has to be tested. Right, right, okay, okay, sure. What I'm saying is like, uh, what I'm saying is in terms of, if you have done any research on that, what I'm saying is did, was the fishing industry in itself collectivized at all or on any similar type of scale that let's say wheat or uh, any other crop well, uh, was? I, again, uh, overall uh, the, the, uh, that industry was collectivized as well. But uh, the question when that happened, I don't know. Again, it's 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 a it's a interesting question and a set of new questions also for us to look at that. I don't know, but I know that eventually they were collectivized as well. Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, you, this situation in Ukraine is still not recognized by the majority of states as genocide. Um, I wonder to what degree uh, our narrative as Ukrainians would change given what you've discovered. Well, uh, uh, the question of genocide and recognition, non-recognition, uh, for me it's question not even legal, the, the, again, the, 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 there is a big part of it that deals with, with legal issues, but it's a political question. And it's a political decision, recognize or not recognize. And uh, uh, the, the definition of the famine that exists today, you take one line and the Holodomor fits it, you take another line and it doesn't fit and it's result of the negotiations where the Soviet Union was part of it and was covering its, its trucks. So it's, it's, it's mostly a political and issue also that is decided on the political level. Uh, in terms of uh, this research that is, that is happening now, how it affects or doesn't affect our, our understanding of famine. Again, if you consider the genocide to be a genocide uh, 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 perpetrated against not ethnic Ukrainians as a group, but against the citizens of Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, I think that uh, what, is, what we are doing is, is provide a strong support for that. We, we clearly see that the Republic is an entity about which they think, that they provide procurement, that they apply political pressure, that they have the same kind of policies. So that's, that's, that's uh, certainly one, uh, one aspect that it can 
support but, but again if it, it's dependent of how you formulate and also the question and how you how you think about the group that was affected the most if you think about again ethnic categories i our research says that at least we don't see we don't see their pattern yes yeah, sir i'd like to know if um, you would say that ironically i repeat ironically those persons who were deported as part of a so-called decolonization into locations far, far from Ukraine, or who were, um, who were deported for resisting um, the collectivization, actually had a much better chance of survival than those who remained. Um, and, and have you done some research in, in, into this particular point? No, but I, I, I uh, again, anecdotal evidence that I have in terms of, again, my own family and in terms of the um, memoirs of people on the both sides, uh, again, it's, it's very clear that their, uh, their um, uh, mm, uh, chances of survival were much higher, but they were not stellar because those people were dumped somewhere in the middle of Taiga, in the Ural Mountains and further there. There were very difficult conditions for, for um, uh, transportation. But my guess on the basis of what I read, I don't have data per se, but on the basis of what I read, that still the rate of survival was, was much, much higher than, especially in the regions of central Ukraine. So they were, in a matter of speaking, lucky that they were shipped out of the of the region before before the worst the worst things started to happen. Professor Plucky, the gentleman two questions ago in the corner asked the question that I wanted to ask. So I for a moment thought I would put the microphone down, but I would like to touch on the question of the genocide and say and I apologize if this is more of a comment than a question now. But um, I would say that a takeaway from this meeting will be that Professor Plochy is soft on the genocidal aspect of the Holodomor. Um, you have to do what you do, and you have to research and look for the truth, and then you have to pronounce yourself um, accordingly. And we respect that you're doing that. But can I urge you to look a little harder <laughs> so that uh, your, 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 your views are not um, difficult to reconcile with the views of Neymark and with the views of the narrative that is accepted by most of the people in this, in this room, not to mention the movie that's coming shortly <laughs> from, from our friends. Um, and after all, if you see markers of genocide in the Kuban, ethnic genocide in the Kuban, but you don't see them in Ukraine, and perhaps you, you partly answer this, is it because, well, Ukraine is Ukrainians. Voila. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, certainly that's, that's the way how they're referred to, including the party leadership in, uh, uh, how Stalin and people around him refer to, to Ukraine, population of Ukraine as a whole. So that's, that, that, that is certainly the case. And um, one, uh, one thing that I can add to, to this treatment of the entire entity of Ukraine, my guess is, and, and I'm, I'm very careful here, but if there would be no such entity as Ukraine, the central part of you, and let's say they would be divided into step areas, and step areas would be called, I don't know, Z Republic, and, and northern areas would be called, uh, I don't know, X or something like that, or uh, Alpha. Um, uh, the government was going after the south, but the, 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 the quotas were given for the entire republic. So those guys in Kiev and Poltava maybe would not suffer if they were not, would be not part of Ukraine as a whole. In terms of connection between, between the, the famine and the idea that these are the Ukrainians and that there is a cultural thing as well, well, we have absolutely 
unique document, and this is December 1932, the resolution of the Politburo, Moscow Politburo by Stalin, in which roughly, I don't remember now, but let's say there, that there are 10 different paragraphs. Eight of them would deal with collectivization and grain requisition. And two of them would deal with the end of Ukrainization outside of Ukraine and issues of culture and accusation that it is Pitlura and, 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 and Pilsudski who are responsible for that. So at least in the mind of Stalin, Ukrainian politics, Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian language, and Ukrainian bread, they interconnected. So that's, that is there and one doesn't even have to go further, uh, further than that. So I, I, I can promise you that I will be, I will be looking harder. <laughs> Just a comment on the ethnic uh, issue. We had Professor Volovina here about a month or a month and a half ago, and they are conducting research on ethnicity and statistics. These may not be exact, but I think they're approximately right. Of every 1,000 Ukrainians who lived in rural areas, 175 died in the famine. That gives you some idea, and that's in the entire Ukrainian Republic. So that meant almost uh, one-fifth of all Ukrainians in rural areas died. The, d the data goes down from there. The next worst hit group are Poles, and they are about 120, as I remember it. All other groups are well under 100. The Germans, about 70 or 80. The Russians, about 70, and Jews, about 50. Now, there may be many explanations for this. You see one explanation in the regional death. These are also areas, the South has a lower percentage of, of, of Ukrainians than the center of Ukraine. So that's one reason as well we see. It may have to do, of course, the, the groups are represented in much smaller numbers, and it may have to be done with their function in these various areas of what, what these groups did and why they were hit. But at least this will not prove intentionality but it'll give us some idea of, of reactions of various groups and survival rates among them. And so I think that's very interesting that he's been able to do this. And it's the kind of work that, that the, this wonderful team of demographers is, I think, uh, doing very well. Then uh, as we conclude our evening, uh, I have one more anniversary that just came to my mind. So it was about 30 years ago that we had a Soviet exchange scholar come to the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute named Serhii Ploki. We were, of course, convinced he was a KGB plant. <laughs> there was no reason he would be sent to us if not to gather, uh, gather information on all of us. And we behaved appropriately to what we thought was going on. Uh, and during that time, uh, uh, we were able to get the Massachusetts state legislature to have a genocide day, which would included Ukrainians. It was a great struggle to do this, a struggle with Kitty Dukakis, by the way, the president's wife. We had a young, very capable information officer named Marta Baziuk, who was working at our institute in those days, uh, and bringing us to do. And uh, I and now Bishop Boris Kudziak were going to speak at this event, which would also deal with the Holocaust, no, no, this was a separate, separate Ukrainian genocide event. So they were not done together. They were done separately that year. Uh, and I noticed that our KGB guy showed up at my talk at the Massachusetts State Legislature. And he stayed for most of the talk, and then he walked out just as I was finishing. Uh, it was only years later that we talked about this, and he found out that he was was very interested, he wanted to go, he wanted to hear it, but of course there had to be a point as a Soviet citizen that he would walk out yet at the event, yes, and so then we found out, but he waited I think almost to the last minute to do it, so I don't know if anyone noticed, but it, but it also showed something else from those days in which I, I think of. It was in around 1980 that, that the Ukrainian Institute at Harvard started the first famine project that brought about uh, Professor Conquest's book. And they began a collection drive in the Ukrainian uh, American community to do this. And this work that all the support staff, James Mace, who worked for years at the Institute, it were the years when we had a delegation in 1981 coming from the UN delegation, Ukrainian UN delegation, 
to inform us that if we would only stop this project, we would have some hope of getting into libraries and archives in Ukraine. And our directors didn't accept that at that point. And although there were voices, I might say, who in that time equivocated what was worth more, do you do this or not do this, but they stuck to their guns and did it in those days. Uh, and uh, at that point, of course, there was not a, no recognition of the Soviet Union and not of many of our colleagues. I think of it today because uh, I'm so pleased to see what the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute is doing 30 years later, uh, led by our friend who came from Ukraine and then stayed in other terms. Uh, it was what these donors who gave the money then, and that was a, a wide scale collection, what they wanted to have done. And it's good to see that these things do get done years later. Uh, what also gets done at Harvard is that a book a year almost appears from, from Siri Plaki. Uh, and you have the chance, uh, if you do not have it, or if you want to give presents, Christmas is coming, two Christmases are coming, uh, to give the gates of Europe. Uh, and uh, Professor Plucky will be able to sign your copies now. So please, uh, please go out. We also have uh, The Man with the Poison Gun. Some people think this is a fiction book because it's written as such good nonfiction uh, about uh, the assassination of Bandera. And uh, we much re recommend uh, this book as well. So please pick up those books and, and sign them. I remind you that, that we are doing our 40th anniversary event uh, on Sunday, three o'clock at the Old Mill, lovely place on the Humber River Valley with what's left of the foliage. You can pick up the notice on, on that event on your way out. We also have booklets on the 40th anniversary of the of CIUS, of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Please get, to, get one, particularly if you're not coming on Sunday so that uh, uh, you can be informed of what our institute does, including the work of HREC, of our Holodomor uh, Research and Education consortium. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, Serhii Ploki for a wonderful and stimulating lecture. <laughs>